Ah yes, finally time to introduce the queen of the monsters. Before we take a look at her epic face-off versus Godzilla, I figured we should take a look back at the origins of the mighty Mothra. Instead of making Mothra just never random villain to feed to Godzilla, they decided to give her her own backstory and everything. This proved to be a pretty good idea as Mothra ended up becoming the second most popular kaiju behind Godzilla and even ended up getting her own trilogy of movies in the 90s. In addition to that, she ended up appearing in 11 total Godzilla films, including the most recent Godzilla King of the Monsters last year. And her origin story was done pretty well too as it told the story of Mothra trying to protect her people against the evil Americans. Well, they weren't technically Americans, they are called Roliskians, but in this movie, the fictional country of Roliskia was basically made to be a combined parody of the United States of America and the Soviet Union. An evil man named Clark Nelson, which is the whitest name I can think of, abducts two of Mothra's young citizens, and which causes Mothra to basically get pissed off and go fuck shit up Mothra style. Of course, Mothra can only appear in so much of this movie, so we also have some good guy humans to help move the plot along. And I gotta say, compared to some of the other Toho films I've seen, the humans were actually pretty decent in this movie. The actors were all really good, the movie didn't really get ridiculous at any point, they didn't make themselves seem bigger than Mothra, and yeah, it was very well executed. But how exactly does it all go down? Well, we're gonna find out right now as we take a look back at Mothra 1961. So we kick off this movie by learning that Japan's been hit by a lot of typhoons recently, and the one happening now is number 8. A ship is unfortunately caught up in a typhoon, which is bringing them right to Infant Island, which is an island that has been destroyed by nuclear testing by the country of Roliskia. Four members of the crew are able to survive and they're brought back to Japan to undergo radiation testing, but to the surprise of all the scientists, none of them tested positive for radiation poisoning. They're not alone though as they're infiltrated by reporters Fukada and Michi looking for a big story. They get their big story as the sailors reveal that they were given juice by the island's natives who weren't known to previously exist. Roliskia decides to respond to this by setting up a co roliskian and Japanese expedition of the island. The expedition is led by very obvious asshole Clark Nelson. Accompanying him on the mission are doctors Harada and Kujo. The doctors don't seem to trust Nelson very much though, and neither does a reporter friend Fukuda who was able to board the ship as a stowaway. They arrive on the island which is revealed to be surrounded by a very vast jungle. Making his way through the jungle, Kujo stumbles upon a mysterious cave. He doesn't find much inside the cave other than some ominous hieroglyphics. He's got bigger problems though as he gets abducted by some kind of giant ass vampire plant which begins sucking his blood. Luckily, two incredibly small women somehow are able to save him from the plant. The next day, they all make their way back to the island, and they confirm the women is real. The twins have a simple request, that they leave the island and make sure that there's no more atomic testing. They all agree to this, well, everyone except Nelson, who attempts to abduct them. But uh-oh, here comes the natives, and oh, come on, it's more fucking blackface. With his entire crew threatening to turn on him, Nelson decides to release the girls, and the natives retreat. After they return home, everyone on board makes an agreement to not tell the public about the events that took place on the island. Back at Kuju's house, Kuju tells Fuguda about the mysterious hieroglyphic he saw, and reveals that it translates into only one word, Mafra. They're also still very suspicious of Nelson, as they should be. He's the very obvious bad guy, and he proves that by going back to the island with a crew and kidnapping the girls anyway. They also shoot down a good portion of the villagers, but one of them, on his last dying breath, pleads to help from their god called Mafra. Mafra is revealed to be a giant egg that hasn't hatched yet, but I have a feeling it's going to pretty soon. Back in Japan, Nelson is making quick work with the twins as he has made them into a major showbiz attraction. The twins sing a song, which Fukuda and Kuju recognize one word from, Mafra. Well, actually it was more like Mafura, yeah, Mafura, but you get the point. Our heroes confront Nelson about him enslaving the girls, and in an attempt to calm them down, agrees to let our heroes see them. During the meeting, the twins use telepathy to communicate with them, and they reveal that Mafra is on her way to rescue them. And yeah, she sure as shit is, that egg has hatched. And apparently Mafra is coming through the ocean. That's ridiculous, it's just a giant caterpillar, it can't swim- oh my god! Yeah, it can swim alright, and it can also destroy a single ship in just one move. Fukuda and Chujo blame this on Nelson, who denies it and threatens to sue them and get them arrested. Rebelling against this, they decide to go upstairs and try to talk to the girls. They're confronted by four of Nelson's bodyguards though, which Fukuda fights off all by himself in one of the worst choreographed fight scenes I've ever seen in my life. Seriously, if Bruce Lee himself saw this fight scene, he would probably get visibly angry. 
Goju talks to the girls and asks them if there's any way to stop Mafra from coming, but unfortunately there isn't, because Mafra can't really understand. All she understands is, oh, you kidnapped my twins? Okay, I'ma come and fuck you up now. They do realize, though, that Mafra is communicating with them through telepathy, and they design some kind of special anti-sound box which is able to stop it. Meanwhile, Mafra's still going for the ocean, but don't worry, the Japanese government have a plan to stop her. Oh great, is it a 50 foot long electrified fence or whatever the hell? No, it's actually napalm. Oh shit, that'll surely work. Yeah, it didn't work. Our heroes give Nelson the box, and his show gets cancelled, but we got bigger things to worry about, as Mafra is currently destroying a dam. A husband and wife make their way across the dam, and they drop their freaking child, which was in the back of their cart. Why a kid was in the back of the cart, I have no idea. The kid almost gets killed by the water, but Fukuda runs in at the last second and luckily saves it. Jesus Christ, somebody call CPS. Well, after all this went down, Kujo's little brother Shinji decides to take matters into his own hands. He breaks into Nelson's place and tries to free the girls, but unfortunately, they find him and beat him up, even though he's like eight. It appears now that Nelson's own country of Reliskia has turned on him, and they're ordering him to release the girls. Kujo, Fukuda, as well as the police show up to arrest Nelson, but it appears he's already fled. At least they found Shinji, though, who they tied up and buried under a lot of shit. They got even bigger problems though, as Mafra has made landfall and she's making her way towards Tokyo. Well, better break out the tanks! The tanks always work, right? Yeah, the tanks didn't work. Okay, tanks didn't work. Better break out the rockets! The rockets always work, right? Yeah, didn't work either. Didn't work with Godzilla, didn't work with King Kong, and it didn't work here. Just get some new stuff already. Anyway, Mafra rampages through Tokyo for a solid five minutes before she finally stumbles upon a radio tower. She breaks the tower in half in order to use it to form a cocoon. Meanwhile, at the Legion of Doom, Nelson has acquired a fake passport and is using it to flee back to Reliskia with the girls inside his suitcase. Reliskia has also loaned Japan some atomic heat cannons, which they're going to use to destroy the cocoon for whatever reason. Hey, it looks like they're successful, they killed Mafra. haha, <laughs> no they fucking didn't. Mafra is, well, adorable first off, but also now in her final form. Using her mighty wings, she basically just blows the whole damn city down before taking off and heading towards Reliskia. Meanwhile, the Reliskian officials have put out a warrant for Nelson's arrest and he is pissed. To add to his problems, Mafra has arrived in the Reliskian New York City parody of New Kirk City. And to make his problems worse than they ever possibly could be, Nelson drives right into a neighborhood where everyone fucking recognizes him and tries to pull him out of the car. So Nelson does the only logical thing he can. Give up? Nah, get out of the car and shoot a cop! He then tries to flee, but the police immediately gun him down because this is America, I mean Merliskia, damn it! Merliskia, fuck yeah, gonna kill the main villain of the story! Never fear though, our heroes are here! And they've got a plan, right? Well, actually, no, they've got no plan, so we better leave this up to Jesus. But wait, the cross. It looks a lot like Moffer's symbol back on the island. And wait, those church bells. They're conveniently playing Moffer's theme song. Using those conveniently placed items, Kujo comes up with a plan. They're gonna draw the symbol on the airport and play all the church bells to make noise to attract Mafra at exactly 3 p.m. And it works out pretty well. Mafra lands and they give her the girls back and Mafra takes the girls back to the island and that's it. That's literally it. Mafra's just like, hey, can I have a chick's back? Yep, here you go. Okay, thank you. I'm a peace out now. And that's it. Movie over. Everybody happy. Mafra lives. Girls lives. Everybody but Nelson lives. So pretty happy to a big positive I can give this movie is honestly, it didn't try too hard. So far what I've noticed about Toho movies is they seem to be a lot better at doing origin stories than they do sequels. For example, this and Godzilla 1954 were both tremendous. Godzilla Raids Again and King Kong Godzilla on the other hand were, eh, kind of meh. It told a very simple tale, but that's all they needed to. It was an origin story. How did Mafra come about? What made her come about? How did everything get resolved? Boom, boom, boom. Did all that very well. And again, I will give credit to the humans in this. While they did have big personalities, yes, it wasn't to the point where they were annoying. The villain was actually very, very solid. It was different in this movie because in Godzilla, obviously Godzilla was the villain. Here, there was actually a, he a human villain, and he was able to pull it off very well. He's got that kind of face where he just looked like an asshole. He had very great sinister facial expressions, which is one thing you need to do this as well. 
And Mothra wasn't overshadowed or made to look weak at all, which is a mistake they made in Godzilla Raids again. In this, Mothra was the forefront, it was all about her, everything centered around Mothra, as it should in a movie called Mothra. And while I don't know if I would say if it was quite as good as Godzilla, I think it was better than both of Godzilla's sequels, and definitely a very solid origin story. I mentioned earlier that Mothra ended up getting her own trilogy in the 90s, and while it will be a while, eventually we will take a look back at those as well. But luckily we didn't have to wait long to see more Mothra, as just three years later in 1964, she would go head to head with Godzilla, and get top billing as far as name goes too, in Mothra vs Godzilla. And in stark contrast to Godzilla, Mothra is a babyface through and through, and that will be her role in Mothra vs. Godzilla, to stop Godzilla from destroying Tokyo, because Godzilla really fucking likes destroying Tokyo. But that is for another time. I hope you guys enjoyed my look back at Mothra 1961. Join me again on this channel next Sunday, or excuse me, next Saturday, for my look back at Marvel's The Avengers. But that is going to do it for me today. I hope you guys all enjoyed. If you want to check out any of my social media links, they are all in the description down below. Thank you as well to all 40 of my patrons currently named in the description for your con support of Miss Channel and my other channel and all my channels. I appreciate you guys. With all that being said, though, my name is Noah Taft. This has been my look back at Mothra 1961. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.